We're going to be talking about codes in the Bible. Stan Tennant is the Director of Research for the Meru Foundation of Sharon, Massachusetts. He has a B.S. in Physics, 1963, from the New York Polytechnic Institute. Mr. Tennant has designed and produced optical and electronic equipment for doctors and surgeons. He holds several patents in his own right. In 1968, while examining the Hebrew text of Genesis, Mr. Tennant noticed what appeared to be a pattern in the arrangement of the letters. This observation, which prompted 30 years of research into the history and mythology of the text, has led to a meaningful understanding of traditional teachings in a modern context. Stan Tennant's explanation of what he has found is a far more elegant uh, in every way you can imagine. Stan, welcome to the program. Thank you, Art. Um, it's really good to be back on. I appreciate it very much. Why do you think, Stan, that Michael Drosnan stumbled into the Bible codes and you stumbled into the Bible codes? I don't know if anybody else is doing serious work in the, in the area, but you must have been for a long time doing parallel work with Mr. Drosnan. I don't know Michael Drosnan. But my understanding is that he's a journalist, he's a reporter. He is reporting on our published works and some unpublished works by statisticians, um, mostly in Israel now, some of whom were originally in, at UCLA a few years ago. Um, I remember reading some of the pre-publication papers that were submitted to statistical science on the codes um, at the office of a friend of mine at UC Berkeley about oh, maybe five or six years ago now. And so there's been a lot of time to think about this. But um, this is modern work. This was done statistically using computers in the last 10 or 15 years um, at, at most. In fact, there was other work done much earlier by a rabbi Weissmandel um, around the turn of the century. Uh -huh. Obviously, he didn't have computers. Um, but when I started my work, I didn't know about Rabbi Weissmandel at all. And the statistical um, codes in the Bible and the Torah, hadn't been, that work hadn't been done yet either. Um, my approach to this was was completely separate and was a, a kind of a, a mystery tale, an adventure, um, because I really didn't have any idea where it was going to lead when I first noticed these patterns um, simply by looking at the text in 1968. All right, well, these patterns, if they are real, uh, have to be repeatable and unambiguous. In other words, that's the scientific method. Uh, they have to be repeatable, something you can uh, see again and again and again throughout the text. Or is it in just a portion of the text or all of it? The statistical work is through the five books of Moses. And one of the astonishing things about that work is that the patterns um, that are statistically most robust are found to be distributed through all five books, which is something that's very disturbing to the academic Bible scholars who believe that the five books of Moses were actually composed by humans over a about a thousand year period. And so finding um, codes in letter sequences that extend through all five books would seem to be impossible from an academic scholarship point of view, which means that they have a different explanation than the explanation of the religious scholars. Um, my explanation is a third explanation which seems to resolve the two in, a, in an unexpected way. It resolves it, too. All right, so that the average human being can understand what we're talking about here. Uh, people say codes in the Bible. Baloney, the Bible says and means exactly what it says and means. There's, there's no need for hidden meaning in the Bible. It, it means just what it says. As you read Genesis, it means precisely what it says. Um, how do you argue... That's not so. I mean, well, there's there's a couple of different problems with that. Um, one, I'm not a Bible scholar in terms of, of the understanding of the narrative um, stories in the Bible. Obviously, I've read the Bible. I've read through the Hebrew Bible. Um, we read through the Hebrew Bible on a yearly cycle in Judaism. So I've, I've read through the Hebrew Bible and the English translations, um, and I'm just not an expert in that. All right. Well, are, that, well, can we talk about uh, Genesis? This is this is what most people don't know. First, the Bible we have in English is a translation um, of one, one form or another. Um, the most common in the United States is the so-called King James translation, yes. which is basically um, 
very similar to the others. There, there are minor differences. The, 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 the official Hebrew translation is a little different than the King James. The, right. the Catholic is a little different than the Protestant versions. Um, but these are in English. The original text of the Hebrew Bible is not written in English. It's written in Hebrew. Um, okay. And Hebrew has a different number of letters in the alphabet, and obviously the words are spelled differently than in English. Right. And what most people don't know about the Hebrew Bible is that both scholars, academic and religious scholars, agree that the oldest versions of the Hebrew Bible, which none exist now, but nevertheless this is understood, were not, the text wasn't broken up into words. It was literally a sequence of Hebrew letters. And even more interestingly, Hebrew doesn't use vowels in, as letters normally, so that you literally can't even read the text unless you know where to divide it up into words, unless you know how it's properly vowelized. And then you can read words that you can translate and that you can assemble into sentences and verses, and that leads to the English translation that we all know and love. Even though it's hard uh, reading the King James Version, and it is hard in a lot of ways for me. I've sat down and I've, I've read, and it reads hard but it does make sense. That's right. That's right. And there's, no, and there's absolutely every reason to believe that the sages and scholars who, who worked on these texts, and worked on these translations, um, did the absolute best job they could. But you have, it's necessary to understand that there is a very ancient teaching about the Hebrew Bible, which is the source of all of this, that very few non-Jews, and even not very many Jews, really know about. Um, I can probably dig up a quotation here directly for you if, if, if someone calls in and really wants it. But there's a, a Kabbalistic teaching that the very worst tragedy that ever occurred in Judaism was not the golden calf, which everyone would think of as the worst thing that you could do, but, but the rabbis actually taught that it was the translation of the Hebrew Bible into Greek, the Septuagint translation, the original translation from Hebrew into a modern language, mm -hmm. that was the worst tragedy. Why did they say that? Because they said the original Hebrew wasn't just a narrative story, it also included patterns in the sequences of letters, which when you make a translation are lost. And the tragedy was that the Hebrew Bible became known only as a narrative story. Now, I'm not disputing the narrative story. Um, that's not an issue here. But in fact, the original teachings are that it was more than that. Right. When you make a translation, obviously you lose, you scramble up the letters. It's not even the same alphabet. All right. When you look at the original text, how do you find these codes? Well, it's really, really quite simple. Um, first, let's describe the, the statistical codes that have been reported on in Michael Drosden's book and, All right. and the statistics. They're very simple. What, what the statisticians did is they asked the computer to search for a wide range of possible so-called letter equal interval letter skip patterns. They would count through, say, ten letters yes. and write down a letter. And then they count another ten letters and write down the letter that occurred there. Right. And they would find that these repeated skip patterns spelled out words. For instance, the word Torah is spelled out at a skip of 49 letters starting pretty close to the beginning of Genesis. Mm -hmm. It is repeated at the beginning of Exodus. Um, and it's repeated in an inverted or a related form as you go through the five books. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the skip is always the same. It's 49 letters. In fact, if you actually examine a table of these so-called equal interval letter skip patterns, you find they fall into two main classes. And this is very important in understanding what's going on. One class is letter skip patterns that are long, say 26 letters or 49 or 50 letters. Those patterns are very statistically robust. One can demonstrate with a high degree of statistical reliability that those patterns can't be accidental, they are really, and I use the word advisedly, woven into the text. Woven, right. The other patterns, the ones that Mr. Drosden and many other people yes. have gotten very excited about, are not these patterns. They are patterns that were also discovered statistically, but they are of much lower statistical reliability because it's not really known what proper statistical test to make. All of statistical science is based on having a model. If you, if you open up any introductory book on statistics, the first thing the author will say in the introduction, in the preface, in the first chapter is, the statistics is a wonderful science, but let's not forget, we can't rely on statistical discoveries unless we have a model that helps to explain the context for the discovery. Mm -hmm. Now, that's the missing piece 
without a context, we can't sort gratuitous, fortuitous, accidental, coincidental codes from really important ones. Well, how does Michael Drosnan come up with Bible codes which seem to predict future events, prophecy, and you come up with Bible codes that uh, reach an entirely different conclusion. Uh, in other words, if there is a statistical reality... Yeah, let's tell them what the conclusion is so they can compare the two. The two right, yeah, what is your... Con all right, fine. Right, but that's important. That, well, yes, it is. Many people know this. Yes, it no. is. No. Let, let me um, use an example that I think the majority of the people listening will be familiar with. Um, this is not from Jewish tradition, but it, it's based on Jewish tradition, and it's, and it's Christian teaching. And the idea is that the Torah, if I can use it in this context, is not a fish of prophecy. It's a fishing pole of prophecy. It's not that they wrote down explicit prophecies. People mistake this. It's not a book like Nostradamus that's telling us explicitly what's going to happen on a particular date in the future. Yes. That's a fish. Instead, my theory is that the text is woven as a kind of exercise that a person can do when they read the text, and that that leads them to a state of consciousness that can enable them possibly, if they're a sage, if they're appropriately saintly, that can lead them to a, a state of prophecy, possibly. Now, I don't even know if such, a, if such a thing really can happen, but there's a big difference between a list of prophecies that are a bunch of fish piled up and a method by which appropriately educated and caring and saintly people could achieve the level of knowledge of some of the sages and prophets of Judaism. In the last program... Uh, there was an aha moment, which came in the second hour, in which you talked about geometric patterns, That's right. uh, which would enable a person to, in effect, and I'm going to be simplistic here, but enter an altered state, and for example, with respect to Genesis, literally experience creation. Let's tell the story, because people actually, we, we got an enormous response to that show, um, close to 500 inquiries, um, uh, which, which I'm really quite overwhelmed with, and I'm very appreciative But of. I do have that they about ask right. This question, they ask this question, can I tell a little more detail about um, this experience that's known in the Talmudic tradition, which most people don't know about. There's a famous story about Rabbi Akiba. Now, Rabbi Akiba was a great sage. He was one of the people attributed um, as, as one of the people that we believe wrote down some of the Kabbalistic, some of the more so-called mystical texts in Judaism, the, the Sefer Yitzhira, for instance. He was known to be an expert on the alphabet. Okay. Um, he is mentioned in the Talmud. He lived um, less than a century after um, the founder of Christianity and, 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 and that whole circle. So it's in the same period in, in, um, in the same cultural context, actually. Um, he is said to have gone, had done a special meditation. Now, first, let's ask ourselves, where would an Orthodox rabbi find the meditation that they would dare to do? Yes. Well, obviously, only looking into traditional texts. They weren't going to do something they made up themselves. There's a lot of teachings that you shouldn't do that. You bet. So we have to assume Rabbi Kiba looked into the Torah and used his knowledge of the alphabet and somehow was able to do this so-called pardes, which is the root of our word paradise. And it refers to the Garden of Eden, the pardes meditation. And the story goes that Rabbi Akiba and three companions who were at, essentially as qualified as he was, great sages, um, endeavored to do this Parde's meditation. And the experience was so overwhelming that the first person that attempted this didn't come out of the meditation. They, they died in the meditation. They were lost in paradise, never came back. The second person was a little more grounded, and they made it back. But they were so overwhelmed by what they saw and experienced in this, this high state of consciousness that, that they became um, kind of a space case, we call them today. They, they were uh, intoxicated with the experience. They were overwhelmed by it. They, they were not rational anymore. The third companion came back okay, but he was so shaken. Um, his name is Acher, I believe, he was, which means the other. He was so shaken that he lost his religious faith entirely and only came back with his rational mind intact. And in fact, because his logic and his knowledge were still so good, he's actually still quoted in the Talmud, even though he's no longer considered to be a religious Jew. But he lost his faith. He lost his faith. Only Rabbi Akiva, who's the hero of the story, comes back whole. 
because he enters whole. That's the, that's the story. He does this meditation. Now, Rabbi Akiva is a key figure in something else. This is during the time of the wars between the Roman Empire and, and Judea and, and, and the Jewish population. Stan, can you explain to me, can I stop you and ask you what you could imagine uh, the experience would be the paradise experience or the experience of Genesis or the, 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 the understanding of uh, all of creation that would cause you to lose your faith? Well, um, it's sort of like having maybe a bad acid trip, to use a modern metaphor, where a person comes back so shaken that it's not that they lose their faith, it's that they can't face it anymore. They're, they're in a state of, of, they're literally overwhelmed emotionally and they can become cold emotionally because they can't deal with it. Um, I, I mean, maybe you could say they were burned out. I hope I'm not being disrespectful here. It was really quite a different circumstance. One of the guys that I consider to be the real McCoy is Gordon Michael Scallion. It's not just uh, my Gordon Michael Scallion, but um, ordinary mathematical researchers have reported that if you turn over in your mind geometric forms, you sometimes have a, an unusual experience. Um, there were some hyperdimensional drawings, um, stereograms, hyperstereograms, in a book by Brisson um, called Hypergraphics, I believe, mm -hmm. that, um, I, as I remember, some of the researchers described as it was causing in themselves unusual experiences. But, you know, there's a very big difference, uh, and Judaism makes a big point of this, and I think Christianity and Islam do too, between the ex particular experience of a talented individual um, such as maybe Gordon Michael Scallion is, and a tradition that can be passed on from generation to generation that codifies a particular meditation that has a particular and safe result within the context of the tradition. Well, is, so, it, is it not possible, Stan, that Stan Tennant uh, might make his way to this particular Pardes meditation uh, in a very specific mathematical Way and somebody else might, in effect, stumble onto what. Absolutely. All right. Absolutely. Uh, the, the the key though is that if you want, let's say, and this is part of the discussion that uh, that I have when I'm trying to explain to people what it is I think I found here, um, because after all, what I've come upon and which we haven't discussed this evening yet is the a means of understanding the source of the Hebrew, Greek, and Arabic alphabets, and the question becomes, well. Why do you create an alphabet? Why do you why do you write things down, and how do you do that? Well, you do that because you want to pass something on explicit. You don't sure. want just a personal experience. Sure. You know, you could have a near death experience falling off a donkey, but it's not necessarily repeatable. I understand. All right. Well, if you want, if if you're talking about a spiritual tradition as opposed to a talented individual, then you have to record somehow the the um, exercise that leads to the experience. And the question is, can you do that in words? Um, no, you really can't. Most people who've had these extraordinary experiences say that they're ineffable, that they're not describable in words. So you have to create a kind of notation, not that describes the experience, but that's kind of like Arthur Murray teaching people to dance the waltz by yes. putting footprints on the ballroom floor. Uh, of course. Well, that's what we think is going on here, that, in fact, like what happens spontaneously to certain talented individuals, there is a long tradition, a Torah tradition, later the Christian Bible, later the Koran, and, and other groups that are related to these two, that have explicit, they, they've charted out a kind of science of consciousness. Oh, yes. We're talking about these codes not being prophecy per se, but rather a navigation system by which a person who is prepared and talented might be able to achieve that level of, of consciousness. Have you reached it? Well, I can tell you I've had certain experiences, but I'm, um, I'm not that saintly a person. Um, when I first came on this, um, I'll tell you exactly what happened. I had been studying these patterns in the text of Genesis right. for about um, ten years. Mm -hmm. And um, I read at one point that some of the teachings were that if you were just able to master the letters of the alphabet, sometimes you could have a, a Kabbalistic experience, whatever right. that might be. Right. So I said, okay. Um, um, I hadn't really paid a lot of attention to it. I didn't really expect anything to happen, but I realized I did have to learn how to at least draw the Hebrew letters properly. Okay. You know, you know sort of, to, to, to be able to read Shakespeare, you have to be able to read and write English. Sure. All right. So I sat myself down. This was before computers at a drawing board. 
with a, um, a calligraphy pen and a lot of paper. And I literally sat there for 16 hours drawing over and over again the letters of the Hebrew alphabet. And what happened was, at some point, I got, I got kind of dizzy, and um, I, I really didn't know what was happening. Um, I was very tired. I was sleepy. Um, maybe this was based on sleep deprivation. I don't know. I really don't have good language for this. Yeah, I guess I'm making my point. You can't describe these things. I felt like I was kind of in a, in a tube, in a tunnel, a vertical tunnel, the walls of which were turning around me, and they were made of kind of flame, and they consisted of the letters of the Hebrew alphabet connected one to the other in a, in a kind of continuous stream wow. that, was, that I was in the middle of. And I got really terrified. I mean, this had never happened to me before. I, I, this is not what I do all the time. Um, I, I don't know how long I was in the experience, but I remember I literally jumped out, scared, and ran out and, 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 and grabbed my wife and hugged her. Um, I, I was really quite shaken by it. And then I spent the next couple of years trying to somehow remember what it was that I thought I saw in this experience. <laughs> and even though it didn't give me the explicit details of what I found later, it kept me going, it kept me looking, it kept me open to the possibility. So that's what happened to me. I, 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 I'm not a regular meditator. Did you? I was going to ask, did you pursue it again? Well, I did. In fact, what I did is... Um, I'm, I'm a technically minded person. I attempted to do something scientific. Yeah, your BS is in physics. Uh, yeah, it's just a BS. So I've done, I've, I've done right. a little extra work, but it's only a bachelor of science. I'm not, I'm not a, a PhD, you know, genius in, in physics either. Um, what I attempted to do was make a kind of um, graph paper that would enable me to more easily draw the Hebrew letters, and I found that what I ended up drawing was a series of circles. And when I looked at this circle pattern and stared at it and, and, and meditated on it, it did kind of elicit the same feeling that I'd had before. And I still have the pattern. We actually published it in our journal a number of years a ago. A circle pattern. It, it was just, well, what it, what it did is it, it basically was designed to confuse the eye so you couldn't gain a sense of perspective. May I stop you and present you with something that I would like you to consider, uh, Stan? Um, I had a guest, a guest on named Doug Ruby. Uh, Doug Ruby uh, has deciphered crop circles. Now, this is not going to be as outlandish as you might imagine. If you draw a circle, and then you draw um, a half circle above it, or a, 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 and then a half circle below it, um, now... That's what you've got. You've got a circle, and, and you've got um, a half, uh, how do I describe this? Hemisphere. <laughs> yeah, a half, half, half hemisphere. Half hemisphere. Another, another half. Um, you have nothing, but if you take that and you spin it, mm -hmm. what you then have is two complete circles. As you achieve rotation, as you begin to rotate this, suddenly you have, uh, in the spinning, two complete circles. Mm -hmm. discernible to the eye. Mm -hmm. And what Mr. Ruby discovered, uh, he's an airline pilot, by the way, is uh, he discovered that if you take crop circles uh, and uh, uh, put them on paper and go through an elaborate business and end up spinning them, they suddenly make all the sense in the world. And isn't it, isn't it a little bit like the way you have approached the Bible? In other words, these are patterns as well, and they're not understood until you do the right thing with them. Well, that, that general principle is correct. Um, I, it's, what we're doing is, is not exactly like that. I, I'm trying to be a no. little more um, um, regular in the way I've been investigating this, and I haven't seen Doug Ruby's work either. But I have done some work with spinning geometric patterns, and in fact, they are very evocative. Um, um, and they do sort of pull some of these patterns out from a flat pattern into three dimensions. That's right. But um, in, if you really understand how this spinning process works, though, um, what we can spin in three dimensions is only a, a minor idea of how you can spin things. There are more complicated spins that one can do to a form that bring it to higher dimensions more fully. So that there's a little more formal process that one can use. Um, 
yes, the way you look at something is going to affect what you see. That's a very important principle, and, and we all have to recognize that. Um, whether you look at pi as a random number, error is completely determined, depends not on the sequence of digits, but on what you know about them. If you don't know how far from the decimal point the digits in pi are, then you can use that as a, as a quasi-random number, and people do that. As soon as you're told that it's so many digits from the decimal point, it becomes exactly pi, and it's totally non-random. The difference between pattern and not pattern is as much in our mind as it is in data. That's why this is a science of consciousness and not just science per se, because there's an interaction with us and, 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 and these patterns. So I, don't, I can't tell you much about the crop circles, but I can tell you the principle is correct. How you look at something does depend, does, does affect what you see. No doubt about that, and that's true in science in general. All right. Um, you, you said you tried to remember you, you had the beginning of this experience or had an experience. How much of it, other than what you just told me, were you able to recall, or are there things you can recall that simply can't be said in words? Well, certainly the fear and, and my, my being overwhelmed by the experience is something I, I can only say the words, but I, I can't, you know, it, it, you don't have that experience until you have it. Um, no, there really wasn't a lot. I wasn't really prepared for it. Um, and, um, in fact, it spurred me to get more prepared. That's one of the reasons why I decided to take Judaism more seriously, which is my background culturally, but I wasn't really a religious person at the time. And I realized that in order to be able to make sense of what I was seeing and experience and looking at, I had to um, stop reinventing the wheel and go back and read and <laughs> study what other people had done and yes. get myself grounded. Yes. That otherwise, even if I could pull this off again, um, I didn't want to come back like one of Rabbi Akiva's friends, dead or crazy. Um, I wanted, if I was going to be able to do something, which I st would still like to be able to do perhaps later in my life, is be whole enough, like Rabbi Akiva was, to be able to come back whole and intact. Um, I guess the modern terminology, um, I, I forget whether this is from Robert Anton Wilson or someone else, is that you don't carry weapons into Chapel Perilous. If you, if you go into a spiritual place to fend it with materiality, then you're going to get whooped by materiality. Mm. If you go in open and undefended, if you're a saintly person, not faking it, really there, then it can open for you. Then it can be a real and positive experience. And I think that's what the story of Rabbi Kiva is about. Whether people were really fully prepared or not, or only really appeared to be prepared, but weren't completely prepared. And the whole point of the rabbi, uh, of, of the Parde's experience, though, I didn't, I didn't really get to finish the story. Most people end the story where we stopped, but there's more to it. And this is what should, should interest our audience and why we have some reason to believe that we are talking about something that may be of a special um, nature and consciousness here. Rabbi Kiva, after this event, goes on to have additional history. Um, he dies tragically. He's literally skinned alive by the Romans, and it's a very painful situation. And he, he says he's, he's in ecstasy at the time. He's not really feeling the pain of it, which is hard for us to understand. I don't, I don't think I could, I could undergo that and, and feel good about it. No. <clears throat> but before this all happens, he appoints a Jewish general, a guy named Ben Kasiba, as Bar Kokhba. Bar Kokhba is a Hebrew Aramaic term that means son of the star. And my feeling is that he was talking about the same prophetic star as became important in the Christian tradition as designating the founder of Christianity. Um, I think that, that that's part of what happened. The story in Judaism, however, is not the same. Um, the Romans eventually do kill Bar Kokhba, and so he's not the Messiah, and that's the end of the story. Except there are diaries kept by one of the most famous Kabbalists of all time, one of the leaders of the Jewish community um, in Islamic Spain, Rabbi Nachmanides, um, he kept diaries of a disputation that he was ordered to participate in under the Inquisition. Disputation? Well, uh, during the Inquisition, they would set up these kind of courts where the Jews would have to prove, try to prove that Jesus wasn't the Messiah. Oh, yes. And the, and the Christians would have to try to prove that Jesus was. And, of course, usually if the Jews didn't agree, they got killed. Oh, they so that's why put them on, position. stretch them out on racks, that sort of thing. Yeah, that well, Cut that's the well, but fortunately for Rabbi Nachmanides, this was done in the court of King James II of Aragon, who was an extraordinary leader, and who kept his word and saw to it that the Jews weren't killed afterwards. But there was a persecution, and Nachmanides had to flee. 
However, during the course of the disputation, and this is this is documented, at one point Pablo Cristiani, the, the representative of the church, asked Rabbi Akiva, um, isn't it true that the Talmud teaches that the Messiah will be born when the temple is destroyed? Mm-hmm. And Rabbi Nachman, I'm not Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Nachmanides um, says, yes, that's true. And then Pablo Christianity asked Nachmanides, well, the temple was destroyed then about a thousand years ago. Um, why, why do you object to Jesus? And Nachmanides says, well, it's, it's not necessarily true that a person acts in the world when they're born. Um, and Pablo Christianity, in, in complete frustration, says to Nachmanides, well, where's he been all this time? <laughs> and Nachmanides replies, and this is where we get back to the story, the Messiah, Mashiach, is waiting in Pardes, waiting in Gan Eden. Mm. The implication is that the experience of this opening to a higher reality. Well, it's incredible work you're doing, Stan, absolutely incredible. And uh, I go into a deep, long period of thought every time I have a conversation with you, and tonight has been no exception. So I want to thank you uh, for being with us.